Welcome back. I just want to set a time frame around these stories. The first post, the first story I told on the moors in Cornwall was set in 1955. The second story where I discovered the key to the universe in yogic philosophy, that was set in 1965, the summer of 1965. And 65 to 66, I was at the Hastings College for their education doing my GCSE in physics and a number of other subjects. And 1966-67, I embarked on an A-level course in physics. And this is um, the autumn of uh, 1966. I was um, in a class and uh, we were about two weeks into the course and me and another student had been interrupting the lessons with questions about the meaning and purpose of life and the, uh, you know, the, how physics could explain the universe, etc. Um, and the head of physics came in and announced that metaphysical questions were no longer to be tolerated and we had to stick to the coursework and not keep interrupting the teachers. Um, well, I was very distressed. I got up out of my seat, stormed down to the lab and slammed the door behind me and ran down the, the road which led from the college down to the beach in a very distressed state. And when I got to the beach, there was a, a gale blowing, and but the sun was shining. It was a magnificent day, very powerful energy the, the, in, in the elements. The waves were crashing on the shingle beach. The wind was screaming and the, the, the gulls were wheeling and calling um, uh, above me. And I cried out to the universe from the depths of my being um, to be shown the workings of the universe, to be given an understanding of, 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 of how um, the physics could explain the universe. And a deep peace settled upon me. It was quite extraordinary, difficult to explain, but somehow I knew my prayer was answered. And I went back, I walked slowly back up the hill and uh, it was time for lunch. And after the lunch, we had a second lesson in physics this time um, given by the head of physics and he didn't seem to be at all bothered by my behavior <laughs> and uh, but he was going around the class handing out these textbooks and then um, so I was given a textbook um, and and they, it was called an MKS course in electricity and it's a, a, quite an unassuming title but um, he was suddenly called out of the room and we were left for about five minutes um, on our own. And that gave me time just to thumb through the book. And as I looked at the last plate in the book, it was a picture of a cosmic ray photograph where uh, a high energy cosmic ray particle was captured in, in the photographic emulsion, slamming into the nucleus of a silver atom. And what it explained is that the motion, the velocity, the momentum of the alpha ray particle uh, was transformed into a shower of uh, new particles called mesons. And as I studied that photograph, I got this, it's like a download, an inspiration, an illumination. It was a real epiphany that if the motion, if the arrested motion of that cosmic ray particle could be transformed into particles of matter, well then particles of matter could be nothing more than motion. That's what they were. And suddenly I had this realization that the underlying fabric of the universe, the stuff that made up the universe was not material substance, but was motion. And it, I later was, was told that that actually is the key to the universe, this understanding that it's energy, that it's motion that makes up the universe and not material substance. But the great enigma is trying to understand how it is that pure motion could form subatomic particles of matter and how energy and matter could be transformed one into the other. We, you know, I was being taught that 
light was a waveform of energy. But now I realize that in the vortex, I had an understanding of, of, of mass, how particles could be formed of spinning energy. And as I looked at that photograph, I realized that the way that these new particles of matter were formed was that as the energy, as the cosmic ray particle was stopped, its energy, its motion didn't stop, but moved on through the nucleus of the atom. So it's almost like the cosmic ray particle hit a brick wall, but the motion of the particle moved on and going through the vortices that made up the nucleus of the atom, passing through the vortices, a bit like batter moving through the shape, the die of a donut making machine. At the other side of the donut making machine, the batter takes on the form of donuts. Well, in a way, the energy in my mind, roaring through the vortices, the swirling uh, uh, whirlpools of light forming the nucleus of the atom, roaring through those vortex shapes, took on the vortex shape. And what it explained in that photograph was that the particles live for the minutest fraction of a second, the tiniest, tiniest. They, 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 it's almost as soon as they were formed, they just evaporated uh, uh, again. And that was clear to me because, you know, if if you were to drop the the new donuts formed as they came out of the donut making machine, instead of dropping them into a vat of boiling oil that fixes them, if you just drop them on the floor, they'd revert to a mass of batter. And so it is that these particles weren't permanent, they were transitional, they just, you know, they just almost came out of the nucleus as a whirl, swirl, and then whew, were gone as heat and light, and back to the waveform of energy again. So I was beginning at that very early age, in that f those first few moments um, of that, in that five minutes before the physics teacher came back into the room, I got this clear understanding of the universe. It's like my, my cry had been answered. <laughs> I came back and the next 50 years I've been working really from that understanding that there are two forms of energy. One is the waveform, which is light. And the other is the vortex form, which is the basis of matter. And you can change one into the other. You can force the waveform through the vortex form and change the wave into the vortex. But it reverts back to the wave. It's, it's almost like it's got a memory. It's like a spring. It springs back to its original shape. But whilst it's forced, it, 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 it takes on the change of shape. So... It was a very exciting time for me that that the, the, that that experience on that day. So I, I really wanted to share that with you, and and I was in in those few moments I got a complete understanding. I've unravelled it since of high energy physics. You know, I can explain what goes on these particle accelerators like CERN, and and the thing is that I I realised that. These new particles were like subatomic donuts, if you like. I, to me, CERN is nothing more nor less than a very expensive subatomic donut making machine. So anyway, I just wanted to share these ideas with you. And I'm going to leave you with a song that um, I wrote in those early days. And uh, I hope you enjoy it. I wrote this for uh, a Swedish girlfriend that I met uh, with my brother Simon. He, there were two girls, Gunilla and Eva, and Simon paired up with Eva and I with Gunilla. And I wrote Gunilla this song, and we met them um, in uh, in Hastings or Eastbourne somewhere. Uh, I think the year, a year later, 1967, we met these girls, and I wrote this song for Gunilla. <laughs>
shadows are strewn by the light of the truth. When we see them, we feel very frail. But strength always comes if we swallow. So again, my love, we have tears in your eyes. Though I hurt you with love in disguise. See here a flower, how freshly it grows. Go with the wind and the blue. Thank you.